Hello, everyone. I'm Anthony Maracola, Manager of Adult Services and Programming at New Canaan Library. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's UN Committee Lecture on Climate Change. This lecture is co-sponsored by the United Nations Committee of New Canaan. The UN Committee of New Canaan was founded in 1952 in response to President Eisenhower's appeal to local communities to honor the US-UN relationship on that, the day in October when the UN was formed. It is one of the oldest continuous grassroots organizations established to support the United Nations in the US. I'd now like to introduce Christina Fagastal, who currently serves as a co-chair to the committee. An active volunteer, Christina has lived with her family in New Canaan for over 20 years. While a native of California, Christina lived overseas for part of her childhood. Many years ago, while in high school and in college, Christina attended Model UN Nation conferences, where she has been interested in the work of the UN ever since. Christina, thank you so much for being with us tonight and co-sponsoring this wonderful event. Before we start, um, I'd just like to give some housekeeping rules. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And the program is being recorded and it will be available within 48 hours on our library's YouTube channel. Welcome, Christina. Thank you, Anthony, for that nice introduction. Um, good evening and welcome to all to this talk regarding addressing climate change, the Paris Agreement five years later and next steps. As you heard from Anthony, my name is Christina Fagerstahl and I currently serve as co-chair of the United Nations Committee of New Canaan. By way of background, 97% of climate scientists have concluded that human behavior, I'm sorry, human caused global warming is happening. And a survey from September 2020 showed that 72% of American adults believe that global warming is happening and that global warming is caused mostly by human activities. 64% of all Americans believe that global warming is affecting the weather and 61% of Americans believe global warming will harm people in the United States. To address this threat, the United Nations has worked out the Paris Agreement, which sets a global frame framework to avoid dangerous climate change by limiting global warming to below two degrees Celsius and pursuing efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The Paris Agreement also aims to strengthen countries' ability to deal with the impacts of climate change and support them in their efforts. Since the signing of the Paris Accords in 2016, the UN Committee of New Canaan has committed to featuring speakers that better inform the New Canaan public regarding the, public, of the subject of climate change. As human beings, we are the unique species on this planet to use our cognitive abilities and cooperation skills to address this issue. The more people understand the importance of working together to improve the health of our planet, the more likely we will succeed. And now it is my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Brendan Guy. Brendan Guy is lead strategist of international climate with the National Resources Defense Council. Guy has taught global climate policy at Oxford University's Blavatnik School of Government and American University School of International Service. He holds a Master of Environmental Management from the Yale School of the Environment and a Bachelor of Science from the University of British Columbia. He is currently based in Washington, DC. And it is my privilege to welcome Brennan Guy to the New Canaan Library tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Christina, uh, for that uh, very, very kind introduction and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you all, uh, even if only virtually this time around. Uh, I really wanna uh, give a big special thanks to, to Christina and the UN Committee of New Canaan for uh, inviting me to speak this evening and especially to Anthony as well and the, the library staff. I, I really hope to be able to, to visit the beautiful new uh, LEED certified library that you had behind you uh, in person once uh, it's finished and, and once COVID is a little bit more in the rear view mirror. Um, so as uh, Christina said, uh, I'm Brennan Guy. I work at the National Resources Defense Council on International Climate uh, Change Strategy. But today I'm gonna be speaking to you in my personal capacity so I can really try and offer a more frank, candid view uh, of some of these really kind of weighty international climate issues uh, that the international community is, is grappling with currently. 
So the plan um, for the for the evening is to just try and sketch um, somewhat briefly uh, a little bit of the story and the narrative and where we are and where we're going in terms of the state of play of international climate issues, including what's at stake uh, in Glasgow coming up in just a few short weeks, who are some of the key players, what is the US doing uh, internationally and locally, um, uh, couple, have a couple slides I'll bring up to help illustrate some of those points, uh, but I really do want to leave the majority of the time to dig into your questions, as I know these topics can sometimes be very abstract or wonky, uh, but I do want to try and uh, be able to help everyone uh, feel like they understand them so they can, so you can be really uh, empowered as agents of change uh, and climate action in your own communities and your own organizations. So to start uh, diving in, um, we can always kind of go back to, to basics, uh, foundational documents, uh, the Paris Agreement. So uh, just as, as Christina was, was recapping, uh, the Paris Agreement really was uh, a major breakthrough. Um, it was the first time there's ever been a global agreement uh, with commitments from every single country, all 195 countries in the world, on what they were going to do um, to address climate change. Um, so it brought all countries together into this common framework, but at the, at the same time, the architects of the Paris Agreement knew it was not going to be enough. And so that's why they designed something into the Paris Agreement um, to be able to continually be ratcheting up ambition and to be driving efforts uh, further and faster over time. Uh, so they, they built into the Paris Agreement what they called a, a five-year ratchet mechanism. Uh, it's kind of a wonky term, but basically every five years, countries would come back to the table uh, to say what more they were going to do and to really kind of have this collective uh, showing uh, of what the international community's efforts to address climate change look like. So uh, five years after Paris in 2015 was supposed to be 2020 uh, as that first uh, collective test. Uh, obviously, a few other things were happening in 2020, uh, so the, the COP was delayed to this year uh, and is now being hosted in uh, Glasgow, Scotland. Um, and again, really is why, why it's such a big deal is because it is that uh, first critical stress test of the Paris Agreement, of this framework, and of countries' willingness uh, to come forward with, with more ambition uh, and to try and meet some of the, the goals of the Paris Agreement uh, that Christina was, was outlining. Um, obviously, in the intervening years, um, there's been a, a little bit of uh, political turmoil, I guess, shall we say, especially uh, here on, on our shores. Um, but there, there really was a lot of attention to that type of changes in politics paid to uh, when designing the, the, the Paris Agreement. Now, no one could have, could have predicted a President Trump. Uh, but uh, there was a lot of resilience and flexibility built, built into the agreement, such that even though President Trump uh, pulled the US out of the Paris Agreement in his first summer in office, uh, in his first summer in office, not a single other country followed suit and exited the agreement, um, which is, is pretty remarkable um, if you think about uh, how much damage they were doing, how many other countries they were trying to, to pull out and undermine international efforts on climate change. Um, so it is you know, somewhat of a testament to, to the agreement, uh, but also a testament to the kind of building global norm that if countries are not taking climate change seriously, that they're somewhat of an international pariah. Um, so clearly the, the Trump administration did have a, a detrimental effect, uh, mostly probably most importantly on the international side, at least in terms of the time lost um, in addressing this challenge that really does have a, a bit of a ticking clock. Um, but certainly it, it could have been much worse uh, if the, you know, if it had been a different framework or a different design. So fast forward, uh, that brings us up to, to COP26, again, this first kind of crucial test uh, of how well the Paris Agreement um, is, is functioning and how effective it is. So this time around though, it's a bit of a different creature um, than, than the conference was in Paris. Most of the action, uh, unlike at Paris, is really in the lead up to um, the conference. Um, and, and at the conference itself, there's actually not that much that's gonna be happening other than tying a, a bow um, together in terms of everything that has already happened to date and saying, here's the kind of sum of, of everything that's happened and a snapshot of where we are and where we need to go. The, the negotiations themselves are, are pretty technical on kind of important, but pretty uh, you know, technical issues 
Um, whereas Paris was all about, you know, getting this deal, getting this framework, figuring out uh, what that, uh, you know, legal uh, framework and that that architecture looked like. But this this is uh, much more about kind of what you put into that framework uh, and what it adds up to. So I'd say there's three key issues um, to keep an eye out for um, going into and, and at COP26, again, to see uh, how everything is, is adding up and how the international community is doing um, in its efforts. So the, the first um, is kind of goes back to, to basics. Again, this uh, every five years, countries coming back to the table with, uh, with more ambition. Uh, I like to kind of uh, make the analogy that it's like a big international uh, potluck uh, for the international community. So every country needs to bring its own national dish with its own national flavor that is ideally as tasty and nutritious as possible, not filled with empty carbs, but is really, you know, pushing uh, the, the needle as, as far as possible in terms of its ambition and what it's bringing um, to, to the potluck. Um, as Christina mentioned at the outset, the, the goal of the Paris Agreement, one, one of the, the three goals was to hold global warming or global temperature increase to well below two degrees, and ideally to hold it to 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, above pre-industrial levels. Um, so that um, is sort of the benchmark that was set out. Uh, the science uh, as, and the impacts, as I'm sure everyone has, has seen and, and heard, have shifted a lot since 2015. So there was a really seminal report uh, by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, the kind of foremost experts around the world uh, who study uh, climate issues uh, in 2018. And that really showed the stark differences in climate change impacts, even from something as seemingly small uh, of a difference from 1.5 degrees Celsius to two degrees Celsius. And just the, the magnitude of those impacts, what it would do to uh, economies, to societies, to the natural world, that really did establish uh, as the new benchmark uh, that we had to be doing everything we could to be aiming for, for 1.5 degrees Celsius and, and holding to that. Um, so the question then becomes, uh, is the world on track uh, to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius? And the unfortunate answer is no, we are not. Uh, we are a fair ways away. So I'm just gonna share two quick slides here um, just to give you a sense of exactly where we are. So this is the first one. Um, this, don't pay attention to, to kind of all the labels, but more so look at the trajectories. Um, so this is from a report that came out from the UN just a couple of weeks ago, basically showing how well we're doing um, with NDCs, which are uh, the, the so-called nationally determined contributions. These are the dishes that countries are bringing to the potluck. That red, that red line is basically how we're doing um, right now with all of those pledges from, from countries. And the, the middle kind of blue um, line going down there, um, that's basically where we need to get to, um, to be on track for, for 1.5 degrees Celsius. So as you can see, uh, there's a pretty big delta between where we're heading and where we need to go in 2030. Um, but you also can really see that, that 2020 really is this, and 2021 is really this kind of critical inflection point where instead of emissions continuing to rise as they have been for, for years, um, that we need global emissions to actually bend um, quite significantly and to start uh, decreasing quite rapidly uh, to be in line with some of the science um, that we've seen from, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and to try and keep global warming within some of those, so those safer levels. So that's kind of where we are. Uh, I think this report said we were on track for about 2.7 degrees Celsius of uh, temperature increase. So not exactly close to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So what does that actually mean in terms of unpacking that a little bit more um, at the country level? So this is a, a hopefully helpful um, snapshot of the kind of global picture of where countries are in terms of some of their commitments and their policies to try and actually achieve uh, that 1.5 degrees Celsius target. Uh, this is from a group called Climate Action Tracker. They do fantastic analysis of, of countries' targets and policies, highly recommend checking them out. But you can see uh, pretty clearly that the, the far right 1.5 degrees Celsius compatible in the green, uh, there's not a lot of green on the map. 
Um, the only country that they rate as being consistent with 1.5 degrees Celsius is uh, the Gambia. And the Gambia is great as a model, but obviously does not have a, a lot of emissions that they're reducing within their borders. So if we look at the, the next category, the yellow, uh, almost sufficient, um, that's where the UK, United Kingdom, obviously host of the, of the COP, uh, they come in as being you know, close, but not quite uh, at uh, being aligned with 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, you see another few uh, countries uh, in Africa coming in there as well too. Moving to the insufficient uh, level, you know, not yet on track to, to be uh, 1.5 Celsius aligned. That's where you have um, the US. Um, that's where you have most European countries um, and, and a few others around the world. Moving further uh, kind of along the spectrum, uh, highly insufficient. Again, this is pretty far off track. Uh, you see major uh, emitting countries, developing countries such as China, such as India, uh, as well as developed countries uh, such as Australia uh, and Brazil, also in that, that former category too. Um, so clearly, uh, you know, little little room for, for improvement uh, there. And then the, the final category, uh, critically insufficient, we see a, a lot of gray uh, in, in the northern part of the map uh, from, from Russia, from, from Saudi Arabia, uh, and, and other countries who are, are really, you know, not uh, pulling their weight uh, any near, anywhere near what needs to be done to, to keep uh, temperatures within 1.5 Celsius. So that's just a little bit of a snapshot in terms of where we're at in terms of that kind of first critical issue and holding uh, temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that really is a lot of the, the impetus and momentum around what's going to be um, kind of uh, packaged together at Glasgow is who is stepping up, who hasn't stepped up enough, and who needs to do more uh, going forward out of Glasgow to really um, keep that, that 1.5 Celsius goal alive. And I'll, I'll get into a little bit more about what the US is doing in a second. We can talk about other countries, uh, China, India, uh, others as well too. So the second key issue to keep an eye on um, is around finance. Um, there was a, a commitment, again, as part of the, the UN climate negotiations for uh, developed countries, so countries like the US, uh, Europe, Japan, others, to mobilize $100 billion per year by 2020. Uh, that commitment was made over a decade ago, um, but unfortunately, according to the, the latest tally, we're, we're about $20 billion short uh, of meeting that goal. So what that does is, is a, a number of things. Um, one, and maybe, maybe biggest, is it does undermine a lot of trust within the international community. Uh, you know, that was a, a promise, a commitment that was made, clearly has not yet been delivered. Um, and so there's, there is a lack of trust uh, um, in terms of uh, the, the, the solidarity between countries and actually uh, meeting that, that target. The other thing it does is it dampens uh, ambition um, from, uh, especially from major developing countries, um, such as uh, you know, India, Indonesia, others. They say, why, why should we step up our targets to reduce emissions if you, you know, in, in developed countries like the US, if you were the ones who caused most of the problem and you're far richer than we are, why, why should we reduce emissions? And so therefore they, you know, say we need, you know, uh, financial resources, technological resources, other resources, if you want us to actually uh, address these, uh, these, these challenges and, 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 and make stronger climate commitments. Uh, the other way it, it kind of really hits is around uh, support for adapting to climate change, so uh, responding to, to the impacts, um, and this is especially true for uh, some of the most vulnerable countries to climate change, thinking of small islands, uh, African countries, um, especially because um, it's hard to attract private capital, private investment into adaptation. Um, you can get public money there. Uh, that obviously is, uh, you know, really kind of a, the core of it. But private money, which, uh, you know, can, can go a lot into technologies like renewable en energy, electric vehicles, there's not a lot of private money um, for adaptation. So that is really where it does kind of come home to roost. Uh, and that, that leads me to the third priority, which is, which is adaptation. Um, so in addition to more money, more resources, more technologies, more support across the board for adaptation, 
um, there are efforts to try and quantify or at least qualify what, what is a, a global kind of goal similar to that 1.5 degrees Celsius goal on adaptation? What is our kind of North Star that we should be all striving towards? And obviously that's challenging because adaptation is, is very local. It's hard to kind of make, uh, roll that up to the global level. But uh, that, that is one piece uh, that's being looked at quite, quite carefully. In addition to this idea that um, especially smaller and more vulnerable countries can only uh, adapt to climate change so much. There's a, a limit to that adaptive capacity. And beyond that, there are gonna be uh, the term of, of kind of losses and damages from climate change. We see that in the US already. We see that uh, even more acutely in, uh, in developing and vulnerable countries. So questions around who pays for those, those losses, who receives support for those losses. These are really thorny issues uh, that are gonna be grappled with uh, around Glasgow. So those are kind of the three big issues um, to keep an eye out for. Um, but I wanna zoom in uh, a little bit more to the United States um, and their role in all of this. So we went through uh, the Trump administration, um, basically what happened um, in, under the previous kind of four years. So now we're fast forwarding, uh, the Biden administration comes in early this year. Uh, the president, President Biden, moves to rejoin uh, the Paris Agreement on day one. You know, it was a key kind of campaign commitment that he had made on, on the campaign trail. Uh, uh, and obviously a, an important move that was welcomed by the international community. But that was only, uh, you know, the start of their journey of uh, really digging themselves out of this pretty massive and sizable credibility hole uh, that had been dug by, by the Trump administration. So the, the next step was figuring out what their dish was, what their national dish that they were going to bring um, to the kind of uh, Paris Agreement party uh, was going to be and how ambitious that was going to be. So, so they really set about figuring out how much they could reduce emissions uh, this decade. Again, these, these targets are, are all for 2030 right now. Um, so how much they could reduce emissions this decade, given, um, you know, the full suite of tools that they have available to them as the federal government and, and working with, uh, with, with other stakeholders as well, too. And so there was, a, you know, analytical effort. There were uh, clearly a number of different stakeholder groups who were pushing, uh, you know, for uh, higher ambition or lower ambition or whatever it may be. Um, and the, the ultimate uh, dish that they settled on uh, was a target to reduce emissions by uh, 50 to 52 percent um, by the end of the decade. So that compares to what the Obama administration had set as a target, which was 26 to 28 um, percent by, by 2025. So five years earlier, um, but doubling uh, roughly the amount of ambition with another five years uh, to make that happen. Uh, so I think it was, you know, widely viewed as, as quite ambitious, uh, you know, not still not enough as we saw in that previous uh, chart to be quite in line with 1.5 degrees Celsius, but definitely pushing the envelope. Um, and now uh, they are really trying to bring to bear a number of the, those tools uh, that they have in their toolkit to accelerate action. Uh, and we see that probably most clearly right now with everything happening uh, on Capitol Hill in terms of the deliberations on the budget reconciliation package and the, bi the bipartisan infrastructure framework, but it also manifests uh, in terms of uh, federal standards that are being uh, put forward by various different agencies uh, and also through kind of ad additional investments uh, that, that aren't included uh, in those other bills through kind of more regular uh, budgetary mechanisms as well too. Um, so that's kind of where, where they're at uh, in terms of their kind of uh, contribution to, to the potluck and we can definitely talk a lot more about that. Um, on the second priority on, on finance, uh, so they also brought um, a finance contribution um, to the table. Um, Biden uh, convened uh, what was called a leaders climate summit in April. Some of you may have seen this where he brought together the uh, leading 20 emitters in the world, the, the presidents and prime ministers of each of those countries, basically to kind of uh, knock some heads together and say, all right, uh, the US is stepping up, uh, you know, we're putting a stronger target on the table, what is everyone else doing? And so you saw stronger targets uh, from Japan, from Canada, um, indications from some other countries that they were going to come up uh, with, with stronger targets as well, too. But the, the one thing they, they did alongside that was to put forward their, their finance um, kind of contribution. And that, that was um, you know, widely seen as a good step, but clearly not enough 
uh, to meet the moment of what was going to be needed. And so there, there was a you know broad pressure and, and you know uh, advocacy and, and encouragement from a wide array of different groups, from you know faith leaders and business leaders and others, to really step that up again uh, and to be more uh, in line again with with uh, that that hundred billion dollar goal. Uh, in which the U.S. is is the biggest kind of shortchanger of of actually meeting that goal. So so just two weeks ago, actually exactly two weeks ago, uh, pres the president uh, announced to to double again that commitment they'd made earlier in the year to eleven billion dollars per year by by twenty twenty four um, at the UN General Assembly. Uh, so that I think was a, a very welcome step, and now it's obviously uh, up to to Congress to to really deliver um, on that commitment and and make that happen. So just the, the last couple of pieces I want to touch on, and then we'll kind of open it up to, to questions and answers. Um, so we talked a lot about the, the federal level in the US. I want to talk a little bit about the subnational level as well, too. Um, so clearly, they were the ones, uh, the leaders, really keeping the flame alive during the Trump administration. You may have seen uh, there was a coalition called We Are Still In, which was governors and mayors and business leaders uh, and community leaders standing up and saying, even though the federal administration is pulling out, we are still committed to Paris and we're still doubling down on our efforts um, to reduce emissions. Uh, so that was hugely important uh, and continues to be hugely important, even with a, a much more friendly federal administration. Um, so just a couple quick examples of kind of what's happening at, at that subnational level. Right now, over one in three people in the US live in a state or city committed to 100% clean electricity. That's, that's pretty sizable and that's shifted a, a lot um, over the last few years uh, and will only continue to accelerate going forward. Uh, there's the, the usual kind of champions you think of that the Californias of the world who have long been a, a climate leader. Uh, you know, they have quite stringent, very aggressive policies, for example, requiring all new cars and SUVs to be zero emissions uh, by 2035. Uh, New York uh, also showing, uh, you know, quite strong leadership uh, with uh, with legislation in the past two years ago, really uh, setting uh, ambitious targets for for the power sector and other sectors, uh, and also setting a really important uh, benchmark in terms of some of the equity issues around climate change. So uh, a target to to ensure that at least forty percent of the benefits of of these investments and policies flow to disadvantaged communities, uh, providing a really important model now that the, the federal government is, is replicating. Um, there's also some unexpected states. Uh, for example, uh, Illinois uh, recently passed legislation becoming the first Midwest state to require 100% carbon-free electricity by 2045. And similarly, really uh, putting equity uh, and justice issues at the core and helping workers uh, and disadvantaged communities really be part of, of that clean energy transition. And of course, cities. Uh, we, we work a lot with cities uh, at NRDC. We have 25 cities who are part of something called the American Cities Climate Challenge, uh, really trying to uh, you know, go leaps and bounds ahead of some of their federal government and state counterparts and really set the model for, for decarbonizing and, and bring others along with them. So that's um, a little bit of a nutshell of kind of the Paris Agreement, uh, what's happening in COP26, where is the US? Um, so uh, just kind of taking a look at the time, uh, I would love to, to open it up for, for questions, answers, uh, please. There are, are no questions too, too big or too small. Uh, so I'll uh, feel those through the chat and uh, please do keep them coming. So just starting with the first question here, I see a question from Quinton, which is what is the correct label, climate change or global warming or are they equally correct? Regardless of your answer, why are the two terms used so widely? Great question, gets, gets to, to fundamentals and basics. Uh, I would say that the most accepted term, um, at least within climate circles, is, is climate change. Uh, global warming was kind of uh, something used, you know, a decade or, or two decades ago. Uh, but we, I think the, you know, scientists and others really recognize it's not just warming. There are lots of very disruptive uh, patterns that, that climate change causes, including sometimes making uh, climates uh, colder than they would have been otherwise, depending on the jet stream and rainfall patterns and other sorts of things like circulation patterns and the Atlantic Ocean. So I would say most people, um, at least experts and kind of others in the community, use the term climate change. 
But I think also the other thing we've been seeing recently is uh, a shift to actually call it what it is, uh, which is a crisis. And so you'll see uh, a lot, especially advocacy groups, but also um, increasingly uh, prominent media outlets. For example, The Guardian uh, only uses the term climate crisis now to really try and communicate to the public um, the urgency of the issues. So uh, a little bit of semantics, but you know, climate change or, or climate crisis are, are definitely ones that are probably most widely used. Um, next question uh, I see is from uh, Alan. Um, this question is, building trust depends on performance. Since so many countries have fallen short of their commitment, where is the trust? Um, fantastic question. That really is at the crux of um, what's going to be hashed out um, in, in Glasgow in, in just less than four weeks now at, at the start of November. Um, trust is, uh, you know, facilitated in a lot of different ways, as you mentioned, from, uh, you know, performance, from living up to commitments, um, from being, uh, you know, uh, someone who actually works uh, in solidarity, especially with some of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. And I think as, as you saw from some of those, uh, those graphs and those figures, no one is doing enough yet. No one is, is living up to uh, the, the level that, that we need to, 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 to keep um, dangerous climate change, um, you know, at, at the, the minimum possible levels. So I think a, a lot of it is, is, is just some level of recognition that uh, addressing climate change is really hard um, because it requires, uh, you know, pretty fundamental and structural shifts in the entire economy. It's not just, uh, you know, like the, ozone, the hole in the ozone layer where you could, you know, switch uh, some certain types of uh, ozone depleting substances to, to others. And it was very small and they were, you know, uh, impacting some, you know, refrigerant companies and air conditioning companies. This literally touches every single part of a global economy. Um, and so it is, it is challenging, but I, I think, uh, you know, having some level of, of humil humility in that, uh, but also recognizing, uh, especially countries that have the, the most responsibility and who have emitted the most uh, over time and caused the most of this problem. Uh, and first and foremost of that is the United States, uh, that they do need to be doing uh, as much as they can and even more than they're already doing. Uh, to try and, and build some of that trust. And it's not going to be easy, especially given the last four years uh, under the previous administration. But uh, I think having some, some humility as well as uh, doing the hard work necessary can help to, to build that back slowly. But it is really going to be a, a test. And I'm sure you'll see in the, in the headlines coming out around Glasgow is you know, critical questions of, <clears throat> of, of trust, especially with uh, vulnerable countries uh, you know, asking have they been hung out to dry? Um, have they been left, you know, to kind of foot the bill uh, for these climate impacts that they have largely not caused? Uh, so a, a really important question and, and, uh, and a good one to keep an eye on. So next question I have uh, from anonymous and anon anonymous questions are, are very welcome. Um, can I back up and explain adaptation? Yes, uh, my apologies for, for not fully explaining that. So there's kind of two pieces um, here to, to this equation, two sides of the same coin. So the first one is, is mitigation. So that's basically reducing emissions. So that's things um, like uh, you know using renewable energy instead of coal to produce electricity. That's things like planting trees or protecting intact forests to make sure that they can soak up carbon. Um, so that's mitigation. Adaptation is kind of, uh, you know, again, other side, of, other side of the coin is climate change is clearly having impacts. Uh, you know, Ida came through uh, pretty intensely, uh, as you all know, um, through, through the Southeast, but also through the Northeast, through, through Jersey, uh, New York, uh, I'm sure parts of Connecticut as well too. So those things that are caused by uh, increasingly climate fuel disasters that cause uh, these types of events to be more extreme and more frequent uh, and to change their historic, historical patterns, uh, the ability to adapt to those, those types of things is what we're talking about here. So whether that's, um, planting uh you know sea grasses or or kelp grasses or or things like uh on on some of the sand dunes making sure that there are there are grasses so that they're not eroded so when there's uh you know coastal erosion or storm surges that they can help buffer and protect from those stronger storms um, it's things um, also like like planting trees um, that really does uh you know help uh, and protecting forests which really does help uh, buffer a lot of the impacts of, of flooding, uh, of stronger storms and, precip and precipitation that we see. 
Um, so it's those types of events that are, are coping with the, the, the impacts of, of climate change uh, and dealing with them that we're, that we're terming uh, adaptation. Um, so I see a question from Diane, uh, which is how are emissions measured? Good question. Um, so most emissions, uh, at least up until recently, have been measured um, by national governments um, using um, kind of their own, um, you know, inventories and their own statistics and their own, um, you know, kind of assessments of what's happening within their borders. And you can imagine that some of those um, measurements are probably not the most accurate or kind of fudge uh, around the lines a little bit or are open to, to some uh, interpretation. Um, and so most of them really do just look at, you know, how much coal was burned in the United States in 2018. And then based on that amount of coal burned, you can, you can figure out how much emissions were associated with that. Similarly, you can do that um, for uh, you know, other types of things such as, such as gas, um, such as uh, you know, oil uh, and cars. You can figure out the, the volume of, of that that was used and then kind of figure out the emissions from that. Harder to calculate, um, harder to calculate are things like emissions from um, from clearing forest or from agriculture or other things like that. And that's usually based on, on models um, or other different kind of direct measurements that you can try and scale up to, to get a sense of uh, what uh, it actually looks like at a national level. So that's kind of been the way that we do it. And so it usually takes you know a year or two to figure out what emissions were like uh, for the previous year. So we don't really have very up-to-date data. Um, but one of the really interesting things that's just starting to come online literally in two weeks ago um, is much more um, data, kind of big data, artificial intelligence, much more real-time data from sensors, from different organizations who are tracking it, from satellites, from all sorts of um, data points that can actually get a much better picture of the emissions that are happening in real time. And so, uh, as I mentioned two weeks ago, there's uh, an initiative launched called Climate Trace uh, and I encourage everyone to, to look it up. Um, it uh, was actually Al Gore was you know, part of it. There were a number of different uh, institutions involved, but that basically tries to get a much better picture of emissions happening in real time in different countries, in different sectors at all different levels and where they're coming from to hopefully give uh, decision makers and the public a lot better uh, and more up-to-date data that they can use um, in getting, getting a handle on emissions. So uh, Climate Trace, uh, definitely recommend checking that out. So I see a question from Michaela on how do we think about these targets alongside foreign policy issues? For instance, I often hear complaints that China and Russia aren't doing enough. So then why should we? Fantastic question. Um, so this really has been uh, an issue that has been coming a lot more to the forefront uh, as of lately. Uh, climate change and international climate issues were always you know, kind of seen as, as secondary issues in, in foreign policy, uh, you know, not really like the hard issues of, uh, you know, security, uh, of defense, uh, of development, of democracy, of, of human rights and things like that. Uh, I think what the, the Biden administration has done is to, to elevate climate change to one of those top tier priorities. And when, when it is elevated to a priority, um, there are fundamental tensions and, and trade-offs uh, with other priorities or things that are, are lower down the priority scale. So I think uh, you've probably most uh, notably seen that in engagements with China. Um, as, you, as you alluded to, there is a very vigorous debate about how the U.S. should be engaging with China. Should it be uh, competing uh, to capture uh, the clean energy markets of the future on solar, on electric vehicles? Uh, should it be cooperating um, because China decarbonizing uh, quickly enough really is in the U.S. interest and in national security interest and economic interest? Because if it doesn't, that's going to harm not only the U.S. Uh, and U.S. Uh, businesses and citizens and livelihoods, uh, but of course the, the rest of the world and, and other interests as well too. And I, I think it often gets painted as a compete with China or a cooperate with China, but it, it is really a spectrum. There's a lot of things that can all be done at the same time. Uh, and I think that's the, the fine line that uh, some are, are trying to walk. Um, you know, for example, uh, Secretary Kerry, who's uh, Biden's uh, kind of lead uh, climate envoy internationally, is, is trying to, to walk that line of, you know, 
encouraging China to do more, but also finding if there are uh, you know, prescribed areas where there can be cooperation that advances the interests of, of both countries. And uh, I think you know, to, the, to the kind of uh, argument of you know, why should the US be doing anything if, if uh, China and Russia aren't doing anything, I, I think it's you know, flipping that argument on its head and being like, why wouldn't the US seize this historic multi-trillion dollar opportunity to, to really be the leader on the clean energy markets of the future, you know, these multi-trillion dollar opportunities over the over the coming years and decades, why wouldn't the US uh, want to be the, the leader and in, in capitalizing on those and, and racing? Um, because we we are behind, uh, to be honest, the, the Chinas of the world, the, the Europe's of the world, uh, others of the world, um, they are really uh, and have, have spent a, a lot more in, in terms of investing in those technologies and really uh, being able to, to be uh, world leaders. So we, we have a little catching up to do. And I think, uh, again, that it is in our interest, not only for that kind of uh, you know, economic imperative, but also for uh, being able to have uh, credibility and the, the trust to say, hey, we're as the US, we're reducing emissions. Therefore, other countries, you know, look at the power of our example. You, you can also do it and we can help you do it, provide you the tools to do it and be, be a, a solutions provider. Uh, again, to, with the goal of reducing emissions such that they're not harming uh, the US to a significant, uh, significant degree uh, that they could be if climate change was, was, uh, was not checked in a meaningful way. So I uh, see a bunch of other questions. So we'll try and uh, kind of tick through them here. Um, so why, I see a question from, um, a couple questions on what are the most important single things we can be doing um, to reduce carbon emissions. Um, good questions, um, no easy answers here. Uh, there is no such thing as a silver bullet uh, when it comes to, to climate change and addressing it. Uh, it's more of a, a silver buckshot where you need a lot of different things happening all at the same time, all scattered and all uh, kind of redundant uh, on each other in case you know one fails, you still have all these other ones that are, that are working ideally in tandem. So I, I'd say a couple things um, at the, we can, we can talk more about the international level. In, in the US, the most important thing right now um, at the federal level, uh, and this probably goes for the US writ large, is uh, the, this budget reconciliation bill um, that is being debated uh, in Congress right now. This is a generational opportunity to get the types of investments uh, and money flowing into climate solutions, the likes of which we have not had in the last decade and may not have again for another decade. Um, so that, uh, which again is, is uh, you know, kind of in the, the whims of, of, of congressional politics right now, that is probably the biggest thing um, that as much as folks can be weighing in, uh, encouraging uh, you know, your congressional representatives, encouraging your elected officials to do the right thing and vote for really strong climate measures in that budget reconciliation package. That is probably number one right now at the federal level. Um, obviously, there's a lot of other levels uh, where you can make meaningful change. Uh, I want to talk about the, the individual level because I know there were some, some questions uh, about that as well, too. In terms of the individual level, um, I'd say there's probably three things um, that are most effective. The first is uh, stay informed. Uh, you guys are already uh, well on track for that one. Um, we know we need to do everything we can to reduce fossil fuel use right now. Uh, we need government policies and corporate action uh, to do that. Otherwise, they're being part of the problem. And as uh, you know, consumers uh, and, and citizens, uh, you know, we have a uh, responsibility to, to figure out uh, you know, where we spend our dollars and where we put our vote. So support companies that do the right thing and ditch companies that aren't doing the right thing and talk about that with your friends. Second piece uh, is, is speak out. Um, so that's everything from writing letters uh, to political leaders, to corporate leaders letters to the editor, social media, let your friends know that you care about the climate crisis. Uh, and you see this as, as a risk um, to whatever it is you care about, whether it's the economy, whether it's social justice, whether it's security, whether it's children's future, whatever it is. Um, let leaders know that you care about this and you're gonna put your vote and your dollar to actually advancing leaders um, that, that care about those issues and prioritize them. And then I'd say that the third thing is holding those leaders to account. 
Um, so that means a lot of things, um, such as showing up at community meetings when we can have those. Uh, ideally, they're happening virtually right now. Community meetings, uh, you know, shareholder meetings. If you have any kind of stock in a company, you can attend shareholder meetings, town halls, other things like that. Show up and put climate on the agenda. Uh, vote, vote in your state, local, federal elections. Make sure your friends vote too. Uh, and when you cast that vote, do you really remember? Um, you know, when they do the right thing, thank leaders for doing the right thing. And when they don't, um, make sure they know it and make sure that they are held accountable uh, and make sure you know what that the difference between doing the right thing and not the right thing on climate is. Um, so that's a little bit kind of at the, the national level and, and the individual level. So hopefully that uh, kind of gets uh, gets at some of those questions. All right, um, I see um, some questions here. So are there countries um, from Shakiba, um, are there countries who are doing better than others? If so, what are they doing right? So this, this goes a little bit to that, um, that figure that I, that I brought up earlier, um, which uh, basically shows that no one is doing everything right yet, um, other than maybe the Gambia. Um, but there is a lot more to be done and there's a lot uh, to be learned from countries who are um, starting to, to really move forward um, aggressively and, and to, to, um, to actually really start reducing emissions. So I would say in, in terms of some of the leaders, um, and this gets to a, another question I see about why the UK has been so successful, um, most of them are, are in Europe. Um, so um, United Kingdom, um, France, um, you know, Nordic countries such as Denmark, um, Sweden, uh, others. These countries, obviously, they're you know some of the wealthiest, but they also are really the the leaders um, in terms of reducing emissions. Um, there's a, a number of other countries. Uh, you know, Costa Rica comes to mind. Uh, other countries come to mind um, who who are also really strongly kind of leading the charge. And I, I think there are a couple common ingredients that those those country has those countries have that can kind of be replicated to other countries so one uh, is just political leadership uh, political commitment to uh, sometimes do the hard thing uh, and and you know it may be uh, that there's a lot of resistance whether that's from industry groups or, or other groups such as we're seeing right now uh, in the US with everything happening on Capitol Hill um, there may be a lot of resistance to that and a lot of, you know, threats, a lot of negative lobbying um, to be able to say, you know, no, this, this is uh, what is in the long-term interest uh, of, of our citizens and of our people and of our economy and of our country. So I think that political courage and commitment uh, is, is a common factor across a number of those countries. Um, I think a, a second thing um, is, is setting bold, ambitious targets, but also backing that up with really strong uh, policy frameworks. So uh, the UK, for example, um, has uh, really incredibly strong targets um, to reduce emissions from, from their energy sector. Uh, so they're, they're striving to be the, the so-called Saudi Arabia of wind, uh, to be a wind superpower. And they have incredibly strong uh, policy support uh, reg regulatory support, investment support to really prioritize getting uh, wind power, both onshore and offshore wind power um, onto the grid to get it connected, to give um, companies and utilities the incentives they need to make those investments uh, and to make sure they're, they're selling the benefits of that to people, which kind of gets me to the, the third point is we have seen um, people try, leaders try to do climate, uh, climate uh, change policies that have not really uh, promoted um, social equity or uh, a transition that, uh, that really uh, you know, ensures that workers uh, and disadvantaged communities are, are not gonna be displaced um, or, or unjustly burdened as part of that transition. And so I, I think, uh, again, as some of the examples in Illinois uh, have pointed to as some of the things that are happening in the European Union, um, especially Nordic countries, uh, point to really having this strong social dim uh, dimension of climate change poli uh, policies is essential. Otherwise, you have things such as, as backlashes um, to, you know, higher gas taxes, uh, you know, somewhat, uh, you know, the result of what we saw uh, in France of, of, of gas tax increases. So to, to make sure that those policies uh, are not hitting 
uh, the lowest income and the most vulnerable populations uh, or you know unduly affecting uh, rural populations or other populations uh, or you know coal workers or, or fossil fuel workers even what does that look like to actually make the investments and provide the support and training and resources and really invest in those communities so they can actually have different options that pay as well uh, and that they have the skills to be able to access um, you know, maybe their union jobs or whatever it is, um, that the, the quality of, of the job uh, and the, the, you know, the number of jobs uh, can be, uh, you know, maybe not apples to apples, but at least somewhat uh, comparable, because right now it's, it's, it's not in, in most countries, it's, it's still um, not, not at that level of policy support uh, that they need to, to really be able to, to help some of those um, workers uh, and, and other uh, and other um, kind of groups to, to be able to transition as effectively as they could be and to, to, to make sure that there's not a lot of resistance and backlash against those policies. All right, I see a couple other questions here. Um, so I see a question um, from Tracy is, what is the breakdown of other country contribution to global warming uh, and carbon emissions percentage wise, specifically China, India, Russia, uh, and secondly, their contribution to the Paris Accord monetarily, despite what the US does, uh, what does it all mean long term? Great question. Um, I wish I had a, a simple graph that could show this, maybe I can try and find one. Um, but Basically, um, the rough breakdown of emissions is China is about 28, 29% of all emissions. The US um, is about 12, uh, 11, 12% of emissions. Uh, Russia is somewhere around kind of five or six. India is around four or five. Um, and the entire European Union, if you, if you put it all together, is about six or seven. So none of those countries in and of themselves are massive in terms of emissions, other than perhaps uh, China uh, and, and the US to a certain degree. Um, but again, that points to the reason why it does need to be this international effort, because even, even if the US emissions went to zero tomorrow, or even if China's emissions went to zero tomorrow, we would still have a massive, massive global problem and a lot of emissions out there. So that is why uh, things like uh, the UN climate uh, agreement, uh, the Paris agreement, and the the, the framework around it are important um, to be able to, to coordinate those actions uh, internationally and to provide some level of uh, transparency and accountability and uh, especially kind of comparison between countries about who is his who is doing what and who needs to be doing more who is who's a leader and who's a laggard um, in terms of, of finance um, Again, I, I don't have a, a simple graph showing this, but um, the European Union uh, provides about 25 billion US dollars per year on finance. Uh, the US right now um, is at about one and a half or two billion. So it is um, far, 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 far behind. Um, and has a lot of a lot of catching up to do. Um, other countries like Japan um, contribute a, a fair amount, um, and and others are, are stepping up as well too. But again, going back to that that gap um, in the in the in the hundred billion dollar goal, um, it really is the U.S. Um, who is uh, shortchanging the the global effort, and a lot of that you know was because of the Trump administration. But uh, even before that, um, you know, it was uh, was not doing enough uh, as as much as it needed uh, to really kind of uh, you know, do its its fair and responsible share, um, given given its role and its relative wealth. So I see a couple more questions. We're getting uh, towards the end here. Um, so question from anonymous: Aren't battery and electrical operated cars going to push uh, the grids as well? Yes, um, great question. So. Um, Clearly, if you have electric vehicles um, that are connected and getting electricity from the grid and that power is coming from uh, not so clean sources, whether that's from coal uh, or gas um, or other sources that, you know, has some benefits for the climate, but is not as great as it could be because of where that power is coming from and the emissions associated with that. So what, um, you know, the ideal is and what um, a lot of groups, including my own and others are advocating for is to uh, you know, electrify everything. That really kind of is one of the linchpins of, of climate change is getting everything electrified. So that includes cars, 
but that also includes, you know, heating uh, and cooling um, and all sorts of other different things uh, becoming electrified um, and generating uh, that electricity from cleaner sources. Um, so that's from the sun, that's from the wind, uh, that's being able to have the storage um, technologies, which we're not quite there yet, but are moving very quickly to be able to store that power from renewable energy sources. So if the sun uh, is not shining or the wind isn't blowing as much as, as, as the power is needed, you can be storing that uh, in, in batteries and, and putting that onto the grid when needed. One really interesting thing, um, which um, is kind of a, a new area of, of research is actually using electric vehicles as batteries. Um, so you can think uh, if you do have a, a grid that is smart enough, our, our grid is not quite smart enough just yet, um, but in, in other countries, it certainly is starting to be smarter. If you had a grid that could say, okay, I see your car and your garage is, uh, you know, tr is not full, it's not fully charged, the wind is blowing uh, at night, and it's generating a lot of energy from wind turbines. We're going to charge all these cars that are sitting in, in garages uh, and use their, their battery basically as a distributed storage device. And when it's daytime and maybe the wind isn't blowing as much or maybe it's a cloudy day, you can be drawing on some of that, um, that battery across all those different vehicles, not only yours, but thousands or tens of thousands of different vehicles to be feeding back into the grid uh, and providing uh, uh, storage. Um, for uh, um, in, in a very distributed way. So interesting things like that um, kind of start to, to come around as soon, as soon as you start to really kind of electrify with renewables and uh, think about creative ways to be to be storing um, that electricity as well too. All right, we got a couple more here. Um, so a, a question from Craig is a major incentive to addressing a problem like climate change is a sense of obligation to people and conditions in the future. In the US, a country, the country is divided about this. What is the best way to address this? Uh, yeah, this, this is the, the crux of it. Um, and I, I, think, um, I think what we have seen is that attitudes about this have been shifting uh, over the last few years, maybe not as quickly as they need to be, but they have been shifting. Uh, I'm sure all of you kind of, you know, know or maybe still somewhat feel this way or, or hear this said that climate change is a very distant kind of future problem that's going to affect future generations or the polar bears or the Arctic. And it's not really, you know, a, a meaningful kind of everyday uh, risk that I have in my life. Uh, I think that for a lot of people uh, has changed. Um, and I, I think part of that is the science and, and people being a bit more attuned to the science, although not that does not sway everyone, obviously. Uh, I think maybe even more importantly is just the, the mounting climate impacts that we see um, in our backyards and uh, increasingly uh, severely or, or, or in our neighbors' backyards. Um, so things uh, like the recent, uh, you know, recent hurricanes and recent storms uh, and flooding, things like uh, the drought, uh, the severe, severe drought and wildfire in California and in the West. Um, those types of things, I think people are increasingly making the connections that, oh, something's different here, something, something weird and very out of the normal realm uh, is happening and making those connections uh, to a changing climate and, and saying, oh, okay, maybe this, is, this isn't a far off uh, issue that's far away from me. This is something that hits my pocketbook. This is something that affects my prosperity, uh, my ability to live a healthy life, you know, free from pollution and free from damages from uh, you know, different disasters and impacts. And it affects their their children. Um, I think that is increasingly a motivator for for a lot of people that at least I hear of of wanting to to leave a you know a healthier uh, and more safe and prosperous world for their children. And so that kind of gets to the okay uh, you know future uh, and future generations question. Uh, but it it is tough. Uh, but I think most. Uh, you know, most of the conversation is really trying to shift into that here and now, and what do we need to do to address the real risks and impacts in the here and now, uh, and not just have this be some kind of far off problem. Uh, but there, there are some really interesting kind of proposals out there. For example, the, the UN has a proposal for a, a, a high representative or commissioner uh, for future generations. So basically an ambassador on behalf of people who are, are not yet born uh, to basically be able to uh, take their, uh, you know, their interests. 
uh, and, and, their, and their voice uh, into consideration in decisions that are happening right now. And so things like that, uh, you know, we may be seeing kind of increasingly um, as, uh, as we kind of get uh, deeper into, into some of these conversations. Great. Um, so I know we're at the hour, but I have with two more questions. We'll try and uh, pop through them really, really quickly. Um, so one from Peter is, why do you think there's so much resistance and denial in the US on climate change? Uh, and one from Anonymous on why is that the private companies are less likely to fund adaptation efforts? Um, great question. So I'll, I'll take the second one uh, first. Um, so things like investing in renewable energy, um, in uh, electric vehicles, um, in all these things, clearly there is um, a profit motive and a profit imperative there that's you know, relatively kind of easy to see why, why companies would be investing a lot there. On the, on the other side, it's a little bit less clear. So for adaptation, again, kind of uh, coping with the, the impacts and managing the impacts of climate change, it's a little bit more of, you know, if you're a company and your supply chains are vulnerable, you know, you can be investing in certain things that protect your supply chains, but it's a little harder to do things that, you know, protect entire communities or entire cities or entire towns. Uh, that's a little bit more kind of in the, you know, in the public domain. Uh, and obviously we, we know that public resources and public dollars are, are relatively scarce, um, you know, in this country, especially in, 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 in other countries as well too. So um, adaptation efforts, for example, things like, you know, building a seawall um, like they have around New Orleans um, to, to help prevent, uh, you know, some of the storm surge and, and the flooding. Those things are very costly, very, very, very costly but uh, obviously have a, you know, had a remarkable impact, uh, including with, with Ida and recent storms, but it's not clear what the profit kind of motive or the, you know, the uh, financial return for a company to do something like that is. Of course, if they're not flooded, uh, their businesses are still able to operate and, uh, you know, hopefully more or less uh, continue, um, even though there are disruptions, but it's, it's not clear, uh, you know, what is that actual return? Uh, it hasn't been monetized, right? It's hard to monetize. So, uh, I think you will probably increasingly see more financial instruments trying to monetize those uh, uh, adaptation efforts a little bit more, but for the time being, it's it's tricky, and so it's mostly uh, those those public dollars uh, that are going into climate adaptation efforts. Uh, really quickly on the very last question, um, why is there so much resistance and denial? I wish I could tell you. Um, I think um, a lot of it is the the kind of old saying about uh, you know people only uh, you know people won't believe something if it doesn't really uh, you know kind of suit uh, you know their uh, their livelihood or their kind of interest to to believe something. And uh, obviously, we're uh, you know very uh, kind of fragmented uh, society, clearly, especially along political lines these days. And so people do really kind of uh, retrench into different, um, you know, bubbles and, uh, and kind of different camps. And we, we do see the real kind of partisan divide between Republican and, and Democratic uh, support for, for climate change. But at the same time, you do see that shifting um, and increasing numbers of Republicans, independents, and Democrats really seeing that climate change is much more of an issue. So I think part of it is just sort of, uh, you know, there's political biases, uh, there's certainly information uh, biases about what types of uh, news media people are consuming and what the interests behind those news media are, whether it's, you know, promoting the fossil fuel industry or trying to, to say we need, a, you know, a different way of, of doing things. So I think all of those things kind of uh, work in concert in addition to, you know, um, industry and, and, and others, uh, you know, really seeing, uh, you know, s sowing doubt in, in people's minds about uh, kind of uh, what actually needs to be done on the scale of challenge. But uh, I think uh, hopefully all of us here can, uh, you know, help see, see through some of that and really kind of do the education and awareness building with our friends and neighbors and relatives and others uh, that's needed to help uh, kind of bring people to a, a higher plane of awareness. So I think with that, we answered all our questions. Well, with that, Brandon, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time and speaking to our community and to everyone who attended tonight. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure it was very informative and there will be a recording of the lecture. And if you want to share it with your family and friends, I highly encourage you to do so. Brendan, you gave us a lot of very um, interesting information and constructive things for us to do. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Really appreciate it.
Have a wonderful evening.